So ready to yeah, start? So you're going to start with you right now? Right. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Um, this recording, we are about to start the lecture, but just a quick thing for the sisters who uh, we were unable, because last minute, alhamdulillah, we was able to put together the slides, the brother, uh, Ustad Naveed, um, a little slide presentation for the lecture, so we, that's why uh, we was a little bit delayed. So, uh, unfortunately, the TV on the moment side is in trouble, so to resolve that, in order for you all to tune in, what you can do is, on your mobile device, go to tv.mpubs.org, I will put the link in the group now, um, and, and make sure your phone is on silent, and you will get the slides on the YouTube channel being streamed live. So the, the actual presentation is being streamed on YouTube live, so you'll be able to get it on your device. Those of you who don't have data on your phone, the password for the internet is Tobago868, all common letters, Tobago868 for the mushroom internet. Just go to your phone, go to tv.npubs.org, and you'll be able to see the presentation streaming live. Just go on, you mix line of this stuff. Yeah. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen Nabiyyana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Amma ba'd First of all inshallah ta'ala as we begin our little discussion tonight I'd like to begin by apologizing for the delay so inshallah ta'ala, we will discuss a very important topic with the theme 
of showing love for the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Meaning, how do we express the true love that we must have for our Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? We would have heard over the last two days, beginning with a lecture from Ustaz Rashid Khan, a very important reminder about establishing the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam based on evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah. And then last night we would have heard from Al Ustaz Abu Mujahid Idu about examples from the early Salaf and how they displayed their love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam meaning from the Sahaba going on from the early generations of Islam. Tonight, inshallah ta'ala, the discussion is a little different. The discussion tonight is about people who claim to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but in reality, they oppose the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They oppose his teaching, his guidance, his statements, and sometimes, as we will see some examples, outwardly opposing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the deen of al-Islam. And this is, of course, very, very dangerous. But as you know, my brothers and sisters, the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is not an ummah that will tolerate any disrespect for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We as an Ummah stand united in our love for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we have seen whether those actions are correct or incorrect. We have seen the response of the Ummah to the world when people try to dishonor or disrespect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the reason I mention that is because it therefore stands to reason that if there were a people who wanted to express some displeasure about Islam or dishonor the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his family, they would not be able to do so among the ranks of the Muslims because the Muslims wherever they are they will not tolerate that type of behavior so when it is that certain people in the lands of the Muslims did not truly accept Islam as we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he speaks about the munafiqeen those who outwardly display Islam while inwardly hide kufr or disbelief they would mock the prophet وسلم, and the sahaba behind their backs when it is that islam began to spread we will see that there were people similar to that after the time of the prophet this discussion brothers and sisters is of course, very important because we have to know that if it is we have people among the Ummah who outwardly show love for the Prophet وسلم, but inwardly have some displeasure or opposition to the Prophet وسلم, then it is more difficult for the average person to detect and therefore a person may fall into certain traps and hence we have a very important statement that actually comes from a line of poetry wherein it says araftu sharra la li sharri lakin li tawqi wa man lam ya'rif al sharra min al khayri yaqa fi it says that i learn about evil not for evil but to be protected from it and whoever does not know evil from good will fall into it. So sometimes when we learn about something, we have to learn 
about the thing that we seek as well as its opposite in order to have a clear definition and in order not to fall into the thing that we are seeking to avoid. In order not to fall into the thing that we are seeking to avoid. طيب. And with that, brothers and sisters, I would like all of us to together go back to the early time of this ummah and recall something that we have here discussed in this masjid before but for anyone else who is listening in the early time the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam islam began to spread around the arabian peninsula after the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we now enter into the time of abu bakr and in the time of abu bakr there were people who tried to oppose islam among the arab and some of them apostated after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. These people were quickly subdued and came back into Islam. But remember that among them, there was a minority, not a majority. These were very few. But among them were, were certain individuals who were not happy with the fact that the Prophet ﷺ came from another tribe so even in for example the time of the prophet ﷺ, we have the example of musaylima musaylima al-kathab a man who claimed to be a prophet and musaylima's claim was not that he did not believe in the prophet muhammad ﷺ, because he openly accepted that the prophet muhammad ﷺ was indeed a prophet but he could not accept the fact that there was a prophet from Quraysh and not a prophet from tamim or from his own tribe or clan or lineage so he wanted to be a prophet as well. So we find these types of movements or ideologies or harakat among certain individuals. And they are not plenty. In the reality, alhamdulillah, the majority of people accepted Islam with truth and honesty and love for this deen. But still, there were a minority, a very few individuals who had some deep-rooted animosity or opposition to Islam. So after that time, we reach the time of Umar. After Abu Bakr, we reach the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And at this point in time, Islam has now spread northward, north, northwards towards Iraq and Sham and eastwards towards Bilad of Faris or Persia and even into the beginning of Egypt the northern parts of Egypt so in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab the boundaries of Islam had spread even further and there were more people now coming into the Ummah of Islam people who were not previously among the Muslims and then we reach the time of Uthman. And we should note before reaching the time of Uthman that Umar ibn al-Khattab was killed by who? He was killed by Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, a Median from the area of Persia. And he was not a Muslim. He was not a Muslim. He was a captive who came to the Muslim lands and he killed Umar by stabbing him with a poisoned dagger. And this is important because it shows that there were people that had hatred for Islam. But Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi was not a Muslim, as I mentioned. He was a Medjian. So it was of no surprise that this occurred. However, the death of Umar was a sort of breaking of a barrier. Because Umar himself was just the type of personality and individual and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed him with, he was a kind of barrier against certain types of fitna and evil. So now we move on to the time of Uthman. And we come across an individual by the name of Abdullah bin Saba, who was a Jew from Yemen. And this Jew from Yemen, he slithered his way throughout 
the Arabian Peninsula going up the west coast through Mecca, Medina and entering into Sham and then he would eventually coil himself up into Egypt being the snake that he was he plotted and planned against the Muslims and his intention was to bring about some kind of fitna or discord or some kind of trouble but he realized that it would not be possible to attack Islam from the outside as the Muslims would be united against such an attack so he realized that just as Paul did to Christianity he would have to attack Islam by pretending to be a Muslim and this is important Ikhwan, because Abdullah bin Sabah would be the one to orchestrate the attack against Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala this great and noble companion who was the Khalifa the leader of the Muslims at that time Al Khalifa to Rashid the righteous leader of the Muslims when Uthman ibn Affan was killed he was killed at the hands of these Sabaiya, the followers of Abdullah ibn Sabah. And we should note that from these people, two groups emerged. And those were the Khawarij, those who make takfir of the Muslims because of any sin that they commit, and they rebel against the Muslim rulers and spill the blood of the Muslims. And we also have another group which are the Rafida, the Shia. So the Rafida begin at this point in time. And they begin by rallying themselves around Ali radiallahu ta'ala. And they claimed that they are Shia to Ali, the followers of Ali, although Ali himself was not accepting of them. In fact, Ali detested them so much that he even punished them and those among them who claimed that Ali was God Almighty Ali radiallahu ta'ala an had them killed because this was no doubt apostasy and this is not from Islam hence why the ulama and those who look at the true belief and the creed of the Shia and we have to understand that this creed would develop over time to include Ta'alih Ali, making Ali a god, making the 12 Imams. We'll talk about the Imams to come afterwards. We'll talk about the Imams. They, they also regard the Imams to be basically in the status of gods besides Allah because they give them aspects of lordship, things that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be able to do. They also reject that the Quran is complete they believe that the Quran is incomplete and whoever rejects a statement from the Quran has disbelieved so they do not accept that the Quran is the true word of God Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they do not believe that the angels are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as some of them believe that Jibreel made a mistake and this of course is not possible by the text of the Quran itself and they also hate the family of the Prophet Sallallahu And this may be a surprising statement to some. Why? Because the Shia outwardly profess love for the Prophet Sallallahu family. And this is their big claim to fame. That we love Ahlul Bayt. We love the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us discuss this issue. Do they really love the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Or is this just something that they hide behind? A mask, a veil that they use to conceal their true creed and belief. Among the Arab, as it is among many other nations, one of the worst insults a man can make to another man is to accuse his wife. The Shia, they accuse the wife of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of heinous acts and they curse the wives of the Prophet وسلم, generally although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran 
that the wives of the Prophet sallallahu are the are the mothers of the believers, and they are free of these types of accusations. And specifically, Aisha radiallahu taala anha, Allah subhanahu wa taala clears her name of any type of accusation, and yet they depict Aisha radiallahu taala anha as some sort of shaitan or some sort of devil. This, no doubt, indicates their true feelings towards the family of the Prophet ﷺ. Who is closer to a man than his wife and his children? Who is closer to a man than his household? And so we see that in reality, they claim that they love the house of the Prophet ﷺ is nothing but mere false words, a smoke screen that they use to hide behind the fact that they actually do not like the Prophet ﷺ. And we will perhaps come back to this towards the end when we contemplate some of the reasons why that may be, why that may be the case. طيب. From here, we want to quickly look at the Imams that they claim to follow and if anyone is looking at the presentation they'll be able to see that they begin the imams that they follow not with the prophet ﷺ, but with ali that is the first indication that something is not correct so they give ali a higher status than the prophet ﷺ. and then they claim that following ali they take al hasan and hussein the sons of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. We will notice, however, and keep this in mind, that they do not take from the progeny of Al-Hasan radiallahu anhu, their imams, but rather they follow the progeny of Hussein. And the reason for this is because in reality, they do not like Hassan for the fact that Hassan made rectification between the ummah by giving up his position of power in order to consolidate the Muslim lands. And they saw this as a type of weakness and betrayal. So they claim then that they follow Hussein and then Ali ibn Hussein, who is Zain al-Abideen, the one that they call Zain al-Abideen, and then Muhammad, who is Muhammad al-Baqir, and then Ja'far, who is Ja'far al-Sadiq, and then Musa was al qathim and then Ali ibn Musa, and Muhammad ibn Ali, and then Ali ibn Muhammad, and then Hassan, who is Hassan al-Askari ibn Ali, and then the last and final Imam that they claim to follow, and in reality they worship, is Muhammad al-Mahdi, the one that they call the Mahdi. And they believe that this Mahdi was born and entered into a cave and that he is alive from that time until today. And they await his coming out of that cave in order to leave the world. And they say that when he comes out, he will resurrect the Sahaba and slaughter them and so on and so forth. And they claim all types of frivolous nonsense about Ahlul Bayt. This breakdown here of who the Imams of the Shia are, is important because we're going to speak about another group. And that group is the Ubaidis, the Ubaidiyah, or the Fatimiya as they are called. Now the Fatimiya or the Ubaidiyah and Ikhwan, as we speak about these groups, we need to understand, we, we're looking at who they are, some of their beliefs, some of their statements, but also we're going to take a somewhat historical approach as well. But we're not going in chronological order. We're going to go, we're going to skip around from time to time. All right. So the Ubaidiyah or the Fatimids, they were a group that appeared and they are what we call Ismailis. So they are a type of Shia that broke away from the Ithna Asharia. So if we go back to the 12 Imams that the Shia have, and we see see Ali and Hassan and Hussein, and then from Hussein we see Ali and Muhammad and Ja'far al-Sadiq. Here we see a split. 
So what happened was the Ismailis, they opposed the other Shia because they said that you follow or you take Musa al Qadim to be your Imam, but in reality, we are supposed to take the eldest son of each Imam. And Ismail was elder than Musa. So Ja'far al Sadiq had two sons, one named Ismail and one named Musa. So the Ismailis, they say, that the Shia, Rafida, are wrong, the twelve us, the twelve, the ones who follow the twelve Imams, they are wrong because they took the younger one to be the Imam, Musa al Khaldim, whereas they were supposed to take Ismail. So the Shia refute them by saying, or the all of them are Shia really, but the twelve us, they refute them by saying that Musa al Khaldim lived long enough to take the role of Imam. Whereas Ismail passed away before he could take the role of Imam, before he was able to inherit that status, he passed away. So the Ismailis, they come back at them and say, even though he died, he had a son. So therefore the grandson, the son of Ismail, Muhammad, is the rightful Imam. And the lineage should be carried from the eldest son. Keep this in mind because we're going to talk about this. This will lead to problems later on on amongst the Ismailis themselves. They start to split and divide because of this very same principle that they have. So they said that Ismail is the true Imam after Ja'far and then Muhammad ibn Ismail and then Hussein and then Ahmad. Ahmad is important because up until this point, we have for the majority of Ahlul Bayt, Ahlul Bayt have been people of Sunnah. Ja'far al-Sadiq, he made a statement. He said, that we are people of the truth and it does not harm us what they claim about us meaning the Shia lie about us but he said that does not harm us it doesn't affect us because we are people of the truth meaning Ahlul Bayt however when we reach down to Ahmad the son of Hussein from the lineage of Ismail Ahmad is the or as claimed he is the founder of the Ismaili movement in reality so he strayed away from them now we need to also mention something about Ahmad because this is where we will lead into the Ubaidis and how the Fatimid Empire actually began or the Fatimid state actually began so uh, this Ahmad he had a son Afan. sorry he had a stepson Ahmad what happened was Ahmad traveled to a land and when he settled in that land, he found a woman who was a Jewish woman who had a child from her husband previous. And that child, his name is Saeed. So Ahmed married this woman. She accepted Islam. And the boy accepted Islam. And he changed his name to Ubaidillah. Now, Ahmad taught them his Ismaili creed and that they were the people of Ahlul Bayt and they were the true followers of Ahlul Bayt and so on and so forth. So, Ubaidullah, who was actually the stepson and not his real son, and there's some, some who claim that he is, but the majority of the historians, they say that Ubaidullah was not the real son of Ahmad. He was his stepson. Ubaidullah became the Imam after Ahmad from this group because he claimed to be his son. So the followers of Ahmad took Ubaidullah to be the Imam who would inherit that status. And these Ismailis at this point, they had people who would go out and secretly they would call people to their sect. And they had a person in Yemen who was leading this movement, the one who was leading this movement, a man by the name of Rustum ibn Haushab. And he sent Abu Sufyan and an individual by the name of Al Halwani, two of their du'at, to Maghrib. Maghrib meaning the western part, the northwest of the continent of Africa, 
where we have Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia today. This was known as Al Maghrib Al Arabi. And these individuals, they found people receiving their da'wah. And so when they passed away, Rustum, he sent an individual by the name of Abu Abdullah al Shi'i. Abu Abdullah al Shi'i is important because he would be the one who would change this da'wah from a secret da'wah to a weaponized da'wah. He would be the one to take up arms and he would be the one to fight. And in the area of Maghrib, and we need to understand, this is very important as well, that the Muslim Ummah was not one country as many people misunderstand. They think that throughout the history of Islam, the Muslims were always one country under one Khalifa. And that's not true. At this point in time in Maghrib, there were four countries. There was the state of the Aghaliba, a country known as the Aghaliba. And there was also the Rustumiya, who were Khawarij. And there was also Bani Midrar, a tribe by the name of Midrar, who had their own country as well. They also were Khawarij. And then we had the Adarisa. And the Adarisa, uh, they, of course, are well known in Morocco. And they were the ones that would continue on the state in that area. As for the three other countries, then Abu Abdullah in that early period, and we're talking about the late 200, so about between 280 to 290, he was able to destroy those three countries and completely conquer them and take them over. The Aghaliba fell and the Rustumiya fell. Bani Midrar was almost completely wiped out, but they did not completely take them out. They still had strength in their capital. And so at this point, Abu Abdullah, and this is where things begin to pick up, Abu Abdullah sent for Ubaidullah, the Imam, to come to their country so that he could announce that he is the leader. When Ubaidullah was on the way, he was captured. And then Abu Abdullah went to free him from jail, from his captivity. And when he came out, he placed him on a horse and he began to kiss his feet and he told the people that this is your Imam. Ubaidullah, this individual, he claimed to be the Mahdi. He claimed to be the Mahdi. And within a few years, we will come to see the reality of Ubaidullah as the Fatimi state or the Ubaidi state is founded. Within a very short period of time, Abu Abdullah and his brother began to doubt if Ubaidullah was actually the Mahdi. And so they began to say that if it were real, they would see signs of him being the Mahdi. But they saw no signs. Ubaidullah's brother, sorry, Abu Abdullah's brother also felt that it was wrong for Ubaidullah to take complete control. When in reality, it was Abu Abdullah who did most of the work. When news of this began to spread and rumors of this type of talk reached Ubaidullah, he quickly had the two of them slaughtered. And so we see the reality of these types of individuals. When it comes to the creed, the people, the muhaqqiqun of Ahlul Sunnah, people like Ibn Taymiyyah and others, they say that the Ubaidis outwardly profess to be Shias, but in reality, they were absolute kuffar. They had no deen whatsoever. And this is why we would see that when the country becomes established, we would find that there's no open signs of Islam, as you would expect to find in other countries. Taib, let us move quickly through time now. We want to go through the Ubaidi state, and we will see that if we look here on the map, you will see that at certain points in time, they were able to expand, but then they also lost land at certain other times. They lost, for example, in, in land in Maghrib. At a time, they conquered Sicily, and then Egypt. We'll get to that, inshallah. So, when it came down to one of their rulers by the name of al muizz din Allah, he had a minister by the name of Johar, a Sikili who was from Sicily, and they were the 
the ones who were able to actually enter into Egypt. They had tried many times to take Egypt and they were not able. And that is uh, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thanks to a very prominent figure in Islam by the name of Kafur al Ikhshidi. Kafur al Ikhshidi was the leader of Egypt and he was actually a slave who rose to power and he became the leader of Egypt. He became the ruler of Egypt, although he was initially a slave. And he was very, very intelligent and he knew how to command armies and he knew how to protect Egypt from these people. So they were not able to defeat him. However, after he passed away, after Kafur passed away, the Ubaidis were able to finally enter into Egypt. And they took advantage of a weak state at that time and the weakness of the leadership at that time. And so the leader of Egypt at that point in time, he realized that he was not able to fight off the ladies. And so he made a deal with them and he told them that they would not fight back and that they would be the rulers. They would accept them as their rulers so long as they do not force anyone to convert to their creed. So long as they do not force anyone to convert to their creed. And so Al Mu'iz promised that he would do so. And of course, within a very short time, he would break that promise. And he would begin forcing people by the sword to convert to their religion, the Ismaili creed. One of the things they did when they entered Egypt was they built Cairo. Cairo as a city did not exist before that time. They were the ones who built it. They also built in Cairo, they built Azhar as an institute, which would become the University of Azhar as we know it today, and the Jamia and so forth. And they did this with the intention of spreading their religion. But Alhamdulillah, in the end, it was not successful. And in reality, it turned against them in a way because these institutes actually help spread the sunnah or spread awareness of other than them. They then tried to force people to curse the companions. This also backfired on them because by forcing the people to do so, it led to multiple revolutions and the people eventually fought against them. They also built a grave for Hussein, although Hussein did not die in Egypt. He died in Karbala. They also built a grave for Ruqayya, as well as a grave for Zainab, although neither of them had ever been to Egypt. So they show, outwardly, you see them trying to do things to show the people that they love Islam and that they love the family of the Prophet Sallallahu although these things make absolutely no sense. And it is around this time that they begin to innovate and declare certain celebrations. From that, the Mawlid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From that, the Mawlid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And we will get to that, inshallah ta'ala, perhaps towards the end, because there's an interesting point as to the day that they chose to celebrate the Mawlid. It's very questionable, the day that they chose to celebrate the Mawlid. At this point in time, they realized that they were not able to convince the people so they started forcing conversions. They killed around 300 scholars at the Nile. From them was a man named Muhammad Ahmad al nabulusi who, because of his severe and strong stance against them, they had him skinned alive. And it just shows the type of people that they were, the type of heartless, merciless type of people that they were. In fact, they used to prefer to have Jews and Christians in their court as their ministers and as their helpers. And the man who was tasked with skinning Muhammad Ahmed and Nabulusi alive was a Jewish man. And while he was being skinned alive, he kept saying, Kana dalika fil kitabi mastura, the ayah in the Quran, that such is written, such it was written. Yani he was making himself patient by reminding himself that this is the Qadr of Allah as he refused to accept their creed and he was killed for that. The Jewish man felt sorry for him because of the torture that he was enduring and rather than skinning him alive, he stabbed him in the heart. After he began skinning him alive, he stabbed him in the heart so that he would die quicker. 
they used to also hang the heads of donkeys in the streets of Cairo and they would write the names of the Sahaba on these donkeys as a means of, of course, belittling the companions of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Alright, then we move forward past Al-Aziz and then Al-Hakim bi Amrillah. We reach Al-Hakim bi Amrillah who is one of the filthiest and worst rulers, not just of the Ubaidis, not just of the Fatimis, not just of the Shia, but of any people on the face of the earth. Al-Hakim bi Amrillah was about seven years old when he uh, was to take the throne. Of course, at that point in time, he was too young. So the affairs of the country were left to two ministers and they were tasked with disposing the affairs of the nation while he would be raised. And of course, they took care of him until the age of 15 when he would accept the role and responsibility of leadership. At the age of 15, when he became the ruler, he had these two people slaughtered immediately. And when he became the ruler, he began to impose laws that were extremely oppressive and ridiculous. He made it haram for anyone to be awake or participate in any kind of trade during the daytime. And he forced the people to wake up at night and do all of their trade at that point in time. And of course, he would contradict this himself because he would go around during the day with a slave that he had, who I believe was a eunuch, a very big slave that he had. And uh, I cannot actually say what he used to do, but he used to forcibly do certain acts to people if he found them awake during the day. As one of the worst things that is recorded in history, but I cannot mention it. Um, he also made eating certain foods haram just by his whim. So he, whatever he wanted. And he claimed to be God incarnate. He claimed that God came inside him and that he was God. And from here, the Druze appear. If you've ever heard of a religion called Druze, this is where they come out from. He placed the Jews and the Christians, as I said, in, the, in his courts and he made them of very high status until people got upset with him. And then without any warning, without any sign, he turned against the Jews and the Christians and he went so far as to demolish their places of worship, even reaching as far as Al-Quds, where he destroyed the Church of Resurrection. And this incident is important because the destruction of the Church of Resurrection is what will be the triggering factor to the First Crusade. The First Crusade, as we know, was a very, very difficult situation for the Muslims. The Kufar, they came in and they desecrated the Holy Lands and they killed and murdered and did heinous acts to many, many Muslims, men, women, and children. So they were the, the ones that would be the factor that led to this crusade. One day, he just disappeared. Some people say that they found his clothes with blood. And of course, it was obviously that he was killed by his own people. They could no longer stand him. After that, he was replaced by Al-Zahir. And then we go on to the time of Al-Mustansir, wherein there was an extreme depression, economic depression, which led to people being in a state of famine and even led to cannabis because the people had no food, they started to eat each other. And he had a, a, a minister by the name of Badr Adin, who was the one who was able to stop this. And he was the one who was able to bring the country back up to some sort of stability. And Mustan said, this is important, he had two children. Remember I mentioned about the Ismailis and how they split because of the elder child supposed to be the ruler after the father passes away. Mustan had two boys, Nazar and Al Musta'li. Nazar was not fit to be a ruler, so they had him imprisoned. And Al Musta'li was the one to take rulership afterwards. This incident would cause a split among them. When Nazar was imprisoned, a man by the name of Hassan al Sabah. 
he felt that this was wrong according to the Ismaili creed the eldest boy was supposed to be the ruler and because of that he split and he left to Persia and he would be the founder of a group known as the Hashashin we'll talk about them very briefly inshallah ta'ala uh, soon so Musta'li became the ruler and then of course the Ismailis actually split after him as well and eventually the coming towards the end of the dynasty now the Abbasids were almost conquered by the Ubaidis were it not for the help of the Seljuk Turks the Turks were the ones who came to rescue the Abbasids and this would give the Turks some power although the Abbasids were the official uh, Khulafa they were the official rulers of the Muslims the Turks would begin to have some upper hand at this point in time. Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, as we reach down to al adid at the end of their rule, the end of the Ubaidis, now we reach the end of their rule, and Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, who was the one who stopped the Crusades, and the one who saved the Muslim Ummah from the Crusades, he would be the one to save the Muslims from the Ubaidis, and he would be the one to put an end to their dynasty, when he entered Egypt, he captured al adid and he placed him in a house and he took all of the women from the Ubaidis and placed them in another house. And so he imprisoned the men separately from the women and with that he ensured that they would not have any children to further their dynasty. And with that, their dynasty fell, alhamdulillah, and that was the end of them. Tayyip, we need to look very quickly at some of the things that they did and ask questions. Number one, they invented the Mawlid up until this point. And remember, these people were some 300 years after the Prophet Up until this point, nobody celebrated the Mawlid. Not the Prophet himself, not the Sahaba, not the Tabi'een, not the Atba'a Tabi'een. Nobody ever celebrated the Mawlid. They were the ones who invented it. These were people who would write the names of the Sahaba on the heads of donkeys and put them up on the road or on the streets. Taib, these were people who hated the companions of the Messenger of Allah Do you think they celebrated the Mawlid because they loved the Prophet Taib, Let us look at the day that they chose to celebrate the Mawlid. They chose the day that the Prophet died to make that the celebration of his birthday. And so you have to ask and wonder, why would they choose the day that the Prophet ﷺ died to make that a day of celebration? If it is not in reality an indication of what they truly believe, which is that they did not love the Prophet ﷺ. Taib, worse than that, of course, and this is, we conclude the Ubaidis with this statement here, they used to sing out in the streets, they would go out at a certain point in time and they would sing, Cursed be the cave and the ones who were in it. And that is in reference to whom? In reference to Abu Bakr. But who is in the cave with Abu Bakr? The Prophet ﷺ. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. So when they say, Cursed be the cave and the ones who were in it, they curse the Prophet ﷺ himself. And also, and remember, the Fatimis, the Ubaidis, they claim to be Shia. They claim to be Shia. Taib. There's a very well-known hadith. It's authentic hadith. It's known amongst Ahlul Sunnah as well as the Shia. And that is the hadith where the Prophet wasallam he took a piece of cloth and he covered himself and Ali and Fatima and their family and he made dua for them. Right? And what did the Ubaidis say? They say, cursed the cloth and who it covered. Cursed be the cloth and who it covered. Which means they curse the Prophet and they curse Ali and they curse Fatima. So how could these people claim to be Muslim, number one? How could they even claim to be Shia, number two? All of this claim and this act that they love the Prophet and they are supporters of Ahlul Bayt, all of it is a lie. All of it is an absolute fabrication. And that is how they hide behind love of the Prophet ﷺ, when in reality, they absolutely detest him. Let us move on from there and speak very quickly about Al-Hashashin, who are the assassins. These were the group, the people, 
Sabah, the one who broke off from the Ubaidis when they chose the younger son over the elder son. These people were absolute terror to the Muslims. And we should not think of them as being in any way, shape or form something to look up to. Don't be deceived by Assassin's Creed and these types of movies and games I think that try to promote the assassins as something good. These people were terrible. They used to use drugs and they were very, very efficient in what they did, which was killing. And they were very, very adept at killing people and sneaking into places and mingling and mixing amongst people in a way that no one would know who they were. So much so to the point. Remember I said that Salah al-Din al-Ayubi was the one to stop the Ubaidis? They almost killed Salah al-Din al-Ayubi themselves. And how they did this? They sent a messenger from one of them to Salah al-Din. And when he went into Salah al-Din's camp, Salah al-Din, he had a number of guards with him in the tent. And this messenger, he came and he said that I have a message for you, but I can only read it in private. I cannot read it in front of everyone. And he said, well, this many of the guards can leave, but these two guards here, these are my closest guards, they stay. They stay wherever I go. And these two are like my children. He said, okay, no problem. These two can stay. And then instead of giving the book or the message to Salah Adin, he turned and faced the guards and he said, if the message comes to you to kill him, are you ready? And they said, yes. Meaning that they had already infiltrated Salah Adin's camp. They were from the Hashashi. And that is how dangerous these individuals were. There's no country to speak of when it comes to them. They were just a group, a sect, that were extremely dangerous. Taib, we're going to skip forward in time to speak about the Safavis, the Safavid Empire, as they are known, or the Safavi Safawiya. And it is important to understand about the Safavis that they began as a Sufi sect, a Sufi tariqa. Taib, a man by the name of Sufi Din Al Ardabili, he was the one who inherited this Sufi Tariqa, and he would become the leader of this group. And then from his descendants would be one who changed and became Shi'i Junaid, and he would take this movement from being a movement of worship and, and zuhud to a military movement. And he would force people to convert to Shi'ism by the sword. When we start to talk about the Safawis, we need to understand the situation that they came in was complete chaos. They emerged at a time when the Muslims had almost fell. There was no government in Persia because Genghis Khan had passed through and absolutely decimated the Muslim lands. And so instead of having a central government, there were just tribes and groups, villages, cities, and there would be a lot of fighting amongst each other. So in this atmosphere, this is where the Safawi movement picked up. Junaid's grandson was a, a, a child by the name of Ismail. Now Junaid passed away in battle and his son Haider also died in battle. Ismail would be the one who would really change the movement of the Safawis. They already began as a military movement by this time. But now Ismail is going to kick things up to a whole other level. So Ismail was taken as a baby and he was removed from the battlefield. He was to be raised in a safe place. But he was raised upon hatred for Ahlul Sunnah. And he was taught from infancy to avenge his father and grandfather. And so by the time Junaid was 14 years old, he began fighting and leading his army. And the difference with Ismail and everyone else, and I say everyone else, I don't mean Ismail and his father, I don't mean Ismail and his grandfather, I mean Ismail and everyone else we've come across so far in the history of Islam, 
is that Ismail, who will be crowned Shah Ismail, was the only person in history that we know of who not only forced people to convert, but he refused to rule over anybody who was not part of his religion. So anyone who was not Shi'i, 12 Ithna uh, Asharia, uh, he would not even rule over them. In Islam, we have many, many from the Prophet Sallallahu time, rulers who would rule over Muslims and non-Muslims. And the Muslims would have their rights, the non-Muslims would have their rights. Look at the history of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, from the Umawis, the Abbasids, and going down, you, you would never find a ruler who refused to rule over somebody because they were of a different opinion or different sect. You will find that in Iraq, the Shia existed without harm. They were not forced to convert. They were not slaughtered. They were not removed from the land. Shah Ismail was different. If you did not convert, it was death. Or you had to flee from the land. He would not tolerate anybody who was not Shi'i. And so this led to, of course, one of the bloodiest periods. Over, We're talking about over a long period of time. One of the bloodiest periods and one of the longest lasting effects of innovation. When he entered the city of Tabriz, and we need to understand, when we talk about Iran today, we talk about Bilal al-Furs, Bilal al-Persia. It's not only Iran. We're talking about parts of Iraq. We're talking about parts of There were only four cities with Shia. And those four cities were minorities. The Shia in those cities were minorities. Cities like Tabriz. The Shia in those cities were a minority, less than 10%, or around 10%. Imagine cities like Tehran, cities like Mashhad, cities like Qum, cities like... These were all entirely Sunni, entirely Sunni, 100%. By the time he finished, all of Persia was more than 90% Shia, less than 10% Sunni. He killed 20,000 people in Tabriz in a single day. When he entered, he would gather the people of knowledge and he would march them up to the minarets and he would throw them off the minarets. And he would have the adhan changed and he would write the curse of the Sahaba. He would, they would write curses of the Sahaba over the doors for the Masajid or upon the Masajid. He also changed the Hajj to Najaf or Karbala. So people could no longer make Hajj to Mecca. They would have to go either to Najaf or Karbala. And of course, they built graves to honor the Imams. In 25 years, that entire region of Persia changed. As I said, from majority Sunni to majority Shi'i. And the issue with that, over all of the other people that we talked about today and the people that we'll finish off with, the lecture, is that the difference with them and with the Ubaidis, and we'll talk about some other people, is that this remained until today. Till today, Iran is majority Shi'i because of the actions of Shah Ismail as Safawi. Altogether, the Safawis would go on to kill over one million Muslims. And remember, brothers and sisters, when we say this, that the Prophet wasallam he said that the blood of a Muslim is more sacred than the Kaaba. The blood of a Muslim is more sacred than the Kaaba. So imagine these people who killed over a million Muslims. The Safawis would eventually be put down by the Ottomans. Alhamdulillah, and the Ummah owes a great, great debt of gratitude to the Ottomans for that. However, we need to be careful because the Ottomans were not always upon the Sunnah. And even when they were fighting against the Safawis, they were very, very much inclined towards killing. And they had their issues as well. 
But the main issue was the Safawis, and Alhamdulillah, they put a stop to it in the end. And they actually humiliated them at the very end. But inshallah, ta'ala, to save time, we'll skip over that and go straight to the Qarabita type. So we're actually going back in time now. We're going back to about the late 200s Hijri, around 270 and thereafter. And the Qarabita, when we talk about the Qarabita, Ikhwan, perhaps some of you have heard of them before. Some of you may not. But the Qarabita represent one of the darkest periods in the history of Islam. One of the saddest periods in the history of Islam. Although it did not last very long, it is one of the most heinous uh, times and some of the most heinous acts were committed at that point in time. Now the Qarameta did not really establish a country per se. They took over parts of al Hassa and what was known as Bahrain at that time. Bahrain, not just the the island of Bahrain, but the region of the eastern part of Saudi Arabia was known as Bahrain. And so there was an individual who was known as Al-Qurmut, and his actual name was Hamdan ibn Ash'af. And he was from around 270s, the late 270s. I'm missing out. Uh -huh. Okay. Now, Qurmut, and this is this is important, Ikhwan. Qurmut was an individual who was very active in worship. And he was very open in worship. But look at the deviance that he fell into. Qurmut used to say that we have to pray 50 times a day. And he was an Ismaili, by the way. He's from the, that same Ismaili group from the, where the Fatimids came from and, and so far, the Hashashin, he's also one of those. So he used to say that we have to pray 50 times a day, not five. And he then called the people to be in under the leadership of Ahlul Bayt. And through that, he, of course, would come to power and power would pass on to an individual by the name of Abu Sa'id al-Janabi. Abu Sa'id al-Janabi was an extremely ignorant individual. He was not someone who had ever learned Islam. He was not proficient in the Quran or anything of Hadith or anything like that. But he claimed to be the messenger of the Mahdi. He was the messenger of the Mahdi. And he came to give, to give glad tidings of the Mahdi. Of course, when the Mahdi did not arrive, as he promised, he was promptly killed. And he was, of course, replaced, oddly enough, by his son, Suleiman. Now, Suleiman... And this is, we're talking about in the, around 290. Suleiman began taking the Qarameta to a more extreme approach. They were already bad enough as it is. They were bad in their actions and so forth. But now he began to take a more extreme approach. And Suleiman began to attack any caravan that was on the way to Hajj. And this continued to happen around that time, the late 290s. And it was recorded that they killed around 20,000 people who were going to perform Hajj. They would kill the men, enslave the women, and steal all of their belongings. And in the year 312, no one was able to make Hajj from that region because of their actions. They were so wicked that no one was able to perform Hajj from that region. In the year 317, they did what no one else had ever done in the history of Islam. They wanted themselves to go to Mecca. So Suleiman, he took his group of Qaramita, and when he reached Mecca, immediately the guards surrounded Mecca and refused to let them in. Because they knew of their reputation, they knew these Qaramita were the ones that were killing the Hujaj, they were the ones killing people making Hajj. So they were afraid that these people had come to Mecca to cause problems. Suleiman, of course, claimed that he did not come to cause any trouble, that he came simply to make Hajj. And look, I am in my ihram, and I am giving you a promise of safety. They did not initially accept this promise. They were very wary, and that's the reason that the region where they would have been. 
they were very wary of the Qaramata of Suleiman. But he said, listen, I promise safety for the people making Hajj. I do not guarantee safety for anybody working for the government. Right? And he said, that is a sign of my truthfulness. Because if I were lying to you, I would guarantee safety for everybody. And then I would just turn around and start to do whatever I wanted to do. But the fact that I'm telling you up, out front, I'm not guaranteeing safety for these people, means I'm being honest. So, reluctantly, the guards allowed these people to enter into Mecca. And so he took his army with him, and they entered into Mecca. And as they entered the masjid, he turned around and called all of his people and said, kill every single person you see. And they began slaughtering everybody at the Masjid al-Haram, at the Kaaba. And they did not leave a single person that they found except that they killed them. The people were running for their lives, people grasping on, holding on to the, the Kaaba, to the door of the Kaaba, to the, the Kiswa of the Kaaba, the covering of the Kaaba. And he would kill them. And Suleiman would kill them one by one. And he would say, Billahi ana wa ana billah. He would say that I am Allah, or I am in Allah, and Allah is in me. Ana billah, wa billahi ana. He said, I created the creation, and I am the one, or, and the one who ends them is me. I am in Allah, and Allah is in me. I created the creation, and who ends them is me. So he claimed to be Allah and then they climbed on top of the roof of the Kaaba, they removed the Kiswa, they broke the door of the Kaaba and they commanded for all of this to be taken back with them. They broke the spout and they took that and they took the black stone out from the Kaaba. And when they were doing this, the Qaramata, those the followers of Sulaiman, they said, where are the flocks of birds? Aina Tuyur al Ababil, mocking the Quran and challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when they were finished slaughtering, they took all of the people. And for those who know, Zamzam is an open well. It is an area you can go inside. You can actually go inside the well of Zamzam. Before, up until very recently, up until probably the 90s, the late 90s, early 2000s, that was open. So they actually took the bodies and stuffed it in the well of Zamzam. And then they took all of the things that they had broken off from the Kaaba, the door, and the Kiswa, and they took the black stone and they took it back to Al Hassan. Now, these people were so evil that even the Ubaidis, who among them were those who claimed to be Allah, and among them were those who cursed the Prophet and cursed the companions, even they were horrified by the actions of the Qaramata and they told them to stop. And in fact, uh, Al-Mahdi, he actually said a statement, which is a very interesting statement. He said, you exposed us in front of the people and you smeared the Ismaili name. Now you smeared the Ismaili name, that is understandable. He did. But his statement, you exposed us. فضحتنا. That is a very questionable statement. Because it shows that in reality, deep down, this is what they were actually about. But they did not want to be known for that. Brothers and sisters, I know it's late. Inshallah, we're going to conclude with that. So don't forget that these people began with a man who used to pray 50 times a day. And he called the people to love of Ahlul Bayt. So when we conclude with this now and we look back at the various people that we spoke about. We spoke about the Rafidah. And we have to ask, why is it that they cursed the Sahaba? Especially Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. But especially Abu Bakr and Umar. And we have to wonder, considering the historical fact that Islam reached that region in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, is it because Islam reached that region in the time of Abu Bakr and Umar that they hate these two people so much? Is it really because they hate Islam 
and they detest Islam, and this is their way of expressing hatred while hiding behind love for Ahlul Bayt. But in reality, think about the Rafidah. They say that they love Ahlul Bayt, but then they curse the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Think about Ubaid. The Ubaidis, the Ubaidillah, the, the followers of Ubaidillah and his dynasty after him. Think about their true feelings towards the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when they would curse the one in the cave and the one under the covering. Think about the Qaramita when they challenged Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala at his house and desecrated his sacred house. Think about the Safawis who had no consideration for life and no honor for or value for the life of a Muslim. And think about the connection between Sufis and Shi'is. Remember that the Safawis began as Sufis. And remember that the innovation of Mawlid, which is carried on predominantly by the Sufis today, began with the Shia. It is a Shi'i celebration. And it took place on the day that the Prophet ﷺ died. So today you will find Sufis who will say that if the Prophet ﷺ was alive today, we would not listen to him if he forbade us from celebrating the Mawlid. This is from the mouth of one of these Sufi leaders himself. He said, if the Prophet ﷺ forbade us from the Mawlid today, I would not listen to him. And brothers and sisters, even groups like Darul Uloom and Jamaat al tabligh in reality, they place the Imams and the Madhab above the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to pray Tahiyatul Masjid. They say, do not pray Tahiyatul Masjid. If you were to walk into one of the masajid, they would say, don't pray Tahiyatul Masjid. The, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is above the throne. They say, no, he is not. The Prophet ﷺ, he said to say Ameen in the prayer. They say whoever says Ameen is a dog. So, brothers and sisters, these are just some small examples. And we have to ask, after contemplating and listening, is this really love for the Prophet ﷺ? Or is this just a veil and a guise that people use to hide behind opposing the Prophet ﷺ? And with that, we conclude, inshallah ta'ala, and I apologize for starting late and taking so long, but the topic was a necessary one. So, jazakumullah khairan for your patience. Right, inshallah, if there's nothing related to the topic, then we'll conclude with that. Wallahu alam. Sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad. على آله وصحبه وسلم